was some perfect moment, and it passed me right by. Perfect moment? For what? What, are you saying you want to die? I'm saying I've lived too long. Hey everybody and thank you for watching another video. My name is Merge and welcome to the Breaking Bad What If series that I call the Heisenverse. A series where I make a change somewhere in the Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul timeline and see how that one change ripples out the entire universe. And in this video we're going to explore what Walter described as his perfect moment to die. And that's somewhere after his first deal he made with Gus and just before Skyler finds out. So think of this more of an alternative take on Breaking Bad Season 2 where things are familiar but not exactly the same. And before we get started if you could leave a like on this video to support the channel I'd appreciate it. Now let's get into it. Hector Salamanca once again sits inside the Casa Tranquila nursing home just days after his nephew Tuco was killed. But ever since that day, he's only had one name rattling around in his head, Walter White. And once word gets out about Tuco, he receives a visit from Marco and Lionel Salamanca and they'd work together in deciphering their uncle's message one letter at a time. Picking up at Jesse's house, him and Walter lay out a map to discuss their plan on scaling up their operation. And even though Jesse's against the plan at first knowing the risk of selling an unknown territory, Walter's able to persuade him with the blowfish metaphor to have Badger, Skinny Pete, and Combo get out there figuring that they can handle it. But only after a few days, they encounter the first of many problems when Skinny Pete gets robbed by Spooge. And after Jesse was told to handle it, he leaves Spooge's house with the reputation that if you mess with Pinkman or any one of his guys, you get the ATM treatment. But if it's not getting robbed by junkies, the other issue they'd face would be the police when Badger ends up getting arrested and sending them back 80 grand. With the only silver lining being that at least now they have a way into the criminal underworld by means of their new lawyer, Saul Goodman. And after he was made aware of Walter's health situation, he gives them an assignment to increase productivity while he makes a few calls to get him a meeting with a high level distributor. So for the next four days out, they manage to cook over 40 pounds of meth equaling over a million dollars in profits. So while they wait for Saul's guy to set up a meeting, they continue to use Badger, Skinny Pete, and Combo to sell in the unknown territory. And for the next few weeks, it would seem that Walter and Jesse's operation is growing into an unstoppable network, especially with Jesse's new reputation being echoed in the streets, and it even affords him to take a weekend off with his new girlfriend Jane. But one afternoon, while Combo's working one of the new areas, he gets approached by two gangbangers driving a lowrider. And thinking that they're new customers, Combo ducks his head inside the car and asks them what they need. But the two guys just stare him down with the only thing being heard is a loud engine roaring. And Combo figuring that these guys are here to try and intimidate him, he gets annoyed lifting his shirt and flashing his gun at them, proving that he's nothing to play with. And as the random gangsters drive away, he starts getting circled by a kid in the area riding a bike. But he pays no attention to the kid when he notices the same car creeping up and parking across the street and not exactly trying to hide. So feeling nervous, he pulls out his phone to call Skinny P for backup. And when the kid tries to make conversation about his piercings, Combo just tells him to get lost as he fixates on the car that's parked across the street. And Skinny Pete, who's been picking up cash in Jesse's place today, just so happens to be the next block over. And in less than 30 seconds, he's right there to get Combo. And as he gets in the car and starts telling Skinny about what's going on, the car that's parked across the street begins to honk their horn, which confuses the duo. But little did they know, that was actually a signal to the young boy on the bike to start shooting. And in the middle of Combo's explanation, the first shot fired would hit the car, shattering the back window, causing Skinny Pete to slam on the gas and peel out of the area. And he's able to evade the following shots before making a hard right and getting out of the range of the shooter. And with them approaching the science museum that they usually meet Jesse at, they go inside to lay low for a while and talk about what just happened. Yo man, was that seriously a kid shooting at us? Skinny Pete says trying to keep his cool while walking around with Combo. Yeah, it was. And now I've seen everything. All I know is, I'm not going back out there, especially knowing that I can get killed by a 5th grader if I'm not careful. Combo says in response. Yeah man, I don't know what Jesse thought was going to happen, but until he gets back into town, I would just say we should all lay low and get off the streets for the time being. Skinny Pete says making an executive order. So as they continue to walk around to kill time and ensure that they weren't followed, Skinny Pete calls and leaves Jesse a voicemail detailing what happened with him and Combo and to call him back as soon as they can. But miles away, Jesse's phone sits inside his car while him and Jane spend the afternoon at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum just having a good time. And since the two been dating, although she kind of figured out that he's a drug dealer, she hasn't yet confronted him about it. Mainly because for the past few weeks of dating, they've basically been inseparable. And between talking about old drawings and future goals, Jane's even managed to convince Jesse to start coming to the Narcotics Anonymous meetings with her. Which works out great for them, because not too much longer after that, she reintroduces Jesse to her father as her boyfriend this time. And he even joins them for a meeting every once in a while. And although he finds Jesse a little rough around the edges, seeing his daughter both happy and sober is all he ever wanted for her. 
So as Jesse and Jane finish up at the museum, they stand outside the little red car smoking a cigarette together. And after getting his phone and listening to the voicemail left by Skinny Pete, his whole mood changes from happy without a care in the world, instantly to a state of dread and despair. And Jane noticing the sudden mood change asks Jesse, I take it that's not good news? And he tells her, there's just, there's just some things you don't know about me and like you're a drug dealer? Jane says stopping a mid-sentence as she continues. Yeah, I kind of got that. And don't worry, you can trust me. Jane says smiling and taking a drag from her cigarette. And at first Jesse has a look of confusion on his face, but then he comes out with the truth saying, one of my guys that works for me, he's my friend, and he was working this new corner that I put him on and he almost got killed. And Jane asks with concern, is, is he okay? Yeah, he's fine, but the craziest part about this whole thing was that they said it was a kid who was shooting at them. Jesse explains leaving her lost for words, because Jane is not exactly in the criminal underworld like Jesse, she's just a recovering addict, so hearing something like a kid killer is something unheard of for her. But even Jesse's taken back by how ruthless things are in unexplored territory, and he exhales a sigh of relief knowing that his friends are safe and not going to be on the streets until he gets back. So as they get ready for the drive back into town, Jane tells him while putting the cigarette out, I just want you to know, you can talk to me about anything. And as they start to drive away, Jesse decides to tell her the whole truth. Crazy Eight, Walter, Tuco, everything. No longer wanting to keep anything else from her. Because out of all the girls he's ever had, Jane just feels like the one he's been waiting for. Over at the oncology center, Walter sits with his family awaiting the results of a CT scan that he took over a week ago. And since that day out in the desert, Walter finds himself coughing a lot more than usual. Sometimes even coughing up blood, which was the primary motivation behind him wanting to cook so much recently. And last week when he got a glimpse of his x-ray and seeing the large spot on his lungs, it all but confirmed that his cancer is getting worse. So as the doctor brings Walter and his family back to the office, he's given the unfortunate news that the cancer has spread to his other lung, making the treatment inoperable and giving him about six weeks to live, which completely devastates the entire family hearing the news. But Walter is the only one who feels a sense of relief now having a general time frame of when it's all going to be over. And as the family goes home, Walter Jr. goes straight to his room being upset about the outcome for his father. And once alone with Skylar in the room, Walter tries to bring some light to the situation by saying, Skylar, I want you to know, before they put me in the ground, I will see our daughter be born. And after I'm gone, you, Junior, and Holly are going to be okay. I promise. I can't tell you how, and I can't tell you when, but trust me, you're going to be okay. But Skylar, who's overly emotional, still hasn't stopped crying since hearing the news. And as Walter pulls her in for a hug and tries to calm her down, he just keeps repeating to her, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And later that night, once everyone is asleep, Walter sneaks off to the bathroom to get his second cell phone where he has over 12 missed calls from Jesse. And when he calls him back, Walter gets informed of what happened on the streets this past weekend and it frustrates him that Jesse made his dealers get off the streets and stop the flow of money coming in. But when he hears the sound of Junior's crutches approaching, he ends the call telling Jesse in a whispered tone, Tomorrow, first thing in the morning at Saul's office. Got it? And before he makes it back to his room, Walter Jr. calls him over saying, Dad? Yes, yeah, son. Walter responds. I'm sorry about earlier. I just... I'm, I'm sorry. And he goes to hug his dad, unable to hold back his emotions. And Walter, while hugging him, says, I'm not going down without a fight, son. So until then, we're going to have breakfast every day and continue to be a family, okay? <laughs> okay, dad. I love you. Good night. Junior says wiping his tears before going back to bed, and when Walter gets back into his room, he wouldn't be able to sleep knowing that he still has a lot of work to do and not a lot of time to do it. Picking up at Saul's office, Jesse and Walter are able to openly discuss what happened in Combo in front of Saul, with the two going back and forth about Jesse's decision to pull everyone off the streets, and Walter's frustration about no money being made for the past few days. And because no one was killed in the situation, Saul manages to stop the two from bickering and gives them an update on their mysterious third party saying, Gentlemen, gentlemen, calm down. You're professionals. Act like it. Besides, I got some good news. I talked to my guy and he should be calling me back any day with some details, so we're not going to have to worry about the street dealing anymore. But in the meantime, Maestro, how's the whole health situation going? And Walter lies saying, It's good. I'm fine. But how much longer before this person calls you back? Because if we're not going to be dealing on the streets, how are we going to move 40 pounds of product? Walter says fanning the smoke away that Jesse's blowing in his direction. And in the middle of throwing out ideas, Saul would get a phone call and on the other end would be the mysterious third party. And Saul says on the line, 40 pounds, wait, you said 40 pounds, right? Yes, yes, that's right, Walter says in response. And Saul finishes up the phone call and tells them, Okay, so the person that you're going to be meeting is going to be at this Los Poros Hermanos restaurant and they want you there in 20 minutes. Hey yo, what the hell does this guy even look like? 
Jesse says with Walter getting ready to go, and Saul responds, Couldn't tell you, but they know who you are, so just hurry up and get there. And in no time, Jesse and Walter heads over to the restaurant, but not knowing who or what they're looking for, they just order something and sit down. But when Walter receives a text message from Skylar saying that the baby's coming, Walter says out loud, Come on, not now. Shit. What's going on, Mr. White? Jesse questions. But before Walter answers, Gus approaches them as the store manager of the restaurant and he asks, Hello, gentlemen. Is everything to your satisfaction? And Walter says, Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you. And Gus says, Excellent. I'm happy to hear that. And I don't want to alarm you, but is your name Walter? Yeah, yes, it is. He responds. Well, there's a gentleman in the front entrance that was requesting you by name, and I believe he said his name was Hank. Gus explains before walking away to wipe down more tables. And Walter not wanting Hank to see him and Jesse together, he quickly gets up and tells Jesse to stay seated while he figures out what's going on. But as Walter goes to the front entrance of the restaurant, he gets stopped by Victor who tells him where to meet and how much money they're offering for the product. And after Walter agrees to the deal, he signals for Jesse to come over and he tells him with urgency. Jesse, I got the location where we're going to make the deal and it's for $1.2 million. But my wife is having her baby right now and I can't do both, so I need you to make the deal. Yeah, of course, Mr. White, no problem. I'll get the product from my house and call you once the deal is done. Just send me the location. Jesse says taken all the weight off of Walter's shoulders. And as he gets inside his car, Walter just says, Thank you, Jesse, as he drives away to the hospital. Later on that night, after the birth of his daughter, Walter is able to make an excuse to get out the hospital to meet up with Jesse at his house. And once inside, Walter looks at two duffel bags that are sitting on the floor and he asks, Is it all there? Yeah, I counted it twice. 1.2 million. And after Saul's cut... That leaves us 480000 each. <laughs> yeah, we did it, Mr. White. Jesse says with excitement. And after Walter unzips the bag to get a glimpse of the money, he starts to get excited as well before the coughing starts. And he grabs the bag of money once he finished composing himself, and he stands in front of Jesse who tells him, So, I guess, I guess this is it. And Walter says, I guess so. And the two share a bittersweet handshake before Walter walks out the door and officially concludes their business together. A few days later, Mike and Gus meet up at a car park to talk about their plans of moving forward with Walter Wyatt. Because behind the scenes, Gus has basically been keeping the Salamancas off his tail because he wants an investment from Walter. But when he gets an update from Mike about Walter's health situation, Gus quickly gives up his pursuit on the master chemist, deeming it a waste of his time if he's going to be dead in a few weeks anyway. So as he starts to rethink his strategy, he may find use for Walter in a different sense by using it more as a sacrificial lamb for the Salamanca twins. But he has to be strategic about this. So in the meantime, he asks Mike to keep an eye on Walter's condition as well as Agent Schrader and he'll hold the Salamancas off until his time. Over with Jesse and Jane, after revealing his money, they both start to plan for the future like they've always talked about. And with them both being clean in this version, Jane's dad would give them his blessing for them to go out into the world. So in the coming days, Jesse meets up with his boys for the last time, and he says to Combo, Hey man, again, I am so sorry about what happened. Hey, don't even stress it, Jesse. No harm done. I mean, other than Skinny's car, Combo says jokingly. And Jesse says while handing some money over to Skinny P, Here you go, Skinny. You know, for the car. Thanks, Jesse. So... You really out of here, huh? Skinny Pete questions while taking the money. Yeah, me and Jane are headed to New Zealand in the morning, so it's gonna be a hell of a road trip, Jesse explains. Man, I wanna miss you, Jesse, but I'm happy for you guys. Just don't forget to stop by every once in a while. Badger says dapping up Jesse. Yeah, definitely. Oh, and before I forget, Badger, I need you to take care of the RV as soon as possible. Jesse says tossing him the keys. We got you, Jesse. It'll get done. But be easy, man. Later. Badger says leaving with the rest of the gang, and not too much longer after that, Jane arrives telling Jesse, You want to do something? Something like what? Jesse responds. Something like... just leaving, like now, like right now, Jane says eating a popsicle, and Jesse says while cracking his smile and grabbing his coat, Let's go. And just like that, Jesse and Jane ride off into the sunset towards their new life and leaving Albuquerque behind. A few weeks go by and Walter's become noticeably frail, mainly because he stopped doing chemo figuring that if he's gonna die anyway, why waste the time? And since making arrangements with Saul about the money, he's got nothing else to do but enjoy the rest of his time he has left with his family. And he thinks back on everything that him and Jesse went through just to get his money. From the encounters he had with Tuco and Crazy 8, to managing a successful double life for the past few months without anyone finding out. And even though it caused some friction between him and Skylar, when it's all said and done, he did get away with it. So one evening while Walter sits in his chair holding Holly, Skylar comes up from behind him picking her up figuring that he's asleep. And when she puts Holly back in her crib, she goes to nudge Walter trying to wake him up, but he doesn't move. And she tries again while also calling out his name. Walt. Walt, wake up. 
but Walter is still unresponsive. It's only until she goes to check his pulse that she discovers that Walter is no longer breathing. And as the tears stream down her cheeks as she goes to take his glasses off, she walks over to the phone to call the police. And right outside, just down the street watching the house would be Mike. And because Walter has been home most days, he wasn't able to plant bugs in the house, so he spends most of his nights watching for an ambulance or coroners to show up. And after almost two weeks, he spots an ambulance approaching the house with the emergency lights off, a sign that he knows all too well when someone dies. And he goes to pull out his phone to call Gus and he tells him, Coroner just showed up. And Gus responds by exhaling before hanging up the phone as he just sits inside the office of the Los Poros Hermanos restaurant, thinking and refining his plan that he has in motion. And just like a game of chess, Walter's death is seen as a pawn to bring out his brother-in-law and potentially take the DEA as well as the Salamancas off the playing board at the same time. And with them coming tomorrow for a meeting, he knows exactly how this is going to play out. The next day rolls around and Saul gets the news that Walter died last night. And as instructed by Walter, he tries to get in contact with Skylar by calling the house phone, but there's no answer. And even though Skylar's home right now, along with Junior, Hank, and Marie, they're all too distraught to answer the phone. And hearing Saul Goodman leave a voicemail, the same guy from the commercials and the bus benches, they would just assume that it's a telemarketer and they would just mute the machine. And while Marie, Hank, and Skylar are all talking about funeral arrangements, Hank offers to go buy pizza and rent one of Walter's favorite movies so everyone could watch as a family. Something that Skylar and Marie agrees to. And when Hank goes to ask Walter Jr. if he wants to come, Jr., who's feeling the death of his father the hardest, ignores him by turning the music up on his headphones. So with Marie being there for Skylar and Holly, Hank goes to take the solo trip alone to the pizza parlor and the video store. And at the same time, over at the chicken farm, Gus meets with Juan Bosa, the Salamanca twins, and Hector to have a discussion about Walter White. And they let Gus know that they've waited long enough to get their revenge, but Gus pretends to hesitate knowing that Hector would like the fact that he's taken something away from him. But once Gus gives the go-ahead to kill Walter White with the knowledge that he's already dead, it concludes the meeting and the Salamanca twins would head to Walter's house right now. And Gus knowing Walter's connection to Hank, he would call him anonymously to warn him that his family's in trouble. But Hank says on the other end, thinking that this is a prank, Hey, I don't know how you got this number, but this isn't funny, asshole. And the line goes silent for a moment before Gus says with his modulated voice, the Salamancas are coming. Then hanging up and breaking the phone, and Hank drops everything that he's doing and he floors it all the way back to Skyler's house. And he tries calling them directly, but there's no answer, and he remembers that they muted the house phone. And as he continues to weave throughout traffic, he calls Marie only to hear the ringtone going off inside the car. And he looks around to see Marie's phone right there in the passenger seat. And with Hank still over 30 minutes away, he calls Steve Gomez and tells him about the phone call he just received. And not wanting to take any chances, he would tell him to go check in on Skyler for him. And as he hangs up the phone, he tightens his grip on the steering wheel, praying that this was just a sick joke. But over at the White residence, the Salamanca twins arrive wearing their bulletproof suits and carrying pistols. But for this job, they prefer to use their signature weapon, the axe. And with very little effort, they gain entry into the home, where currently Marie and Skylar are inside the bedroom talking, and Walter Jr. is inside his room with the headphones on. So no one even notices the danger that they're in. And with Holly inside her baby crib out in the living room, the two brothers look at each other, and they start with her. Meanwhile, Hank is still navigating through traffic, and after avoiding countless car accidents, he's now pulling up outside Skyler's home. And as he approaches the door, seeing it already slightly open, he barges inside only to stand in utter shock to see his wife, sister-in-law, and baby niece all murdered and laying lifeless on the ground. But before he can even process what's going on, he sees one of the Salamanca twins coming at him from the corner of his eye with an axe, and he would shoot and kill Marco, instantly dropping him to the ground. But when Lionel comes out of Walter Jr.'s room with his gun drawn, him and Hank exchange a few shots before Hank is outgunned and he falls to the floor. And the shots he was able to get off does little to no effect due to Lionel's bulletproof suit. And as he stands over the wounded DEA agent, he fires, killing Hank and putting it into the Schrader and White bloodline. And afterwards, the lone Salamanca would look over to his brother who is clearly dead and he leaves a card of the Grim Reaper on the top of his body before he leaves the house. But when stepping out the front door, he comes face to face with Steve Gomez who's holding a shotgun already locked and loaded. And as he tries to warn him in Spanish and English to get on the ground, Lionel ignores the warnings and goes for his gun. But with no hesitation, Steve Gomez pulls the trigger multiple times, dropping the Salamanca right at the doorstep. And as he goes inside calling out for Hank, he is lost for words at the gruesome crime scene of an entire family being slaughtered. And again, parked just down the street witnessing the entire thing would be Mike Ermintrow. And as Gomez goes to walk inside, he again makes a call to Gus Fring and he tells him, It happened. Exactly how you said it would. The Salamancas as well as Schrader, they're all gone. And Gus smiles and says, Excellent. We still have work to do in setting up the lab. Can you get with Victor and Tyrus to ensure that everything is ready? You got it. Mike says hanging up and pulling away. And as for Gus, he's actually on his way to meet with the cook that he essentially built a lab for, Gail Bedeker. 
Hey everybody and thank you so much for watching this video and I really hope you enjoyed another story from the Heisenverse. And I'd say the real hero of this story has got to be Skinny Pete because him saving Combo was all it took for Jesse to have his happy ending. Which the same cannot be said for Walter's family who were all killed just for some move. And a part of me is tempted to make a part 2 but I think it's pretty clear that Gus wins. He has scale, he has the lab, and I'm sure with the right amount of planning he can find another way to get the cartel. But that's just me. But now I want to hear from you guys. What do you think of this story? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Was it predictable? Just your overall thoughts. Whatever it is, let me know down below in the comments and I'll do my best to respond. But until then, my name is Merge. Later.